Dear members of CA Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter, the members of other overseas chapters, all other CA Sri Lanka members and participants around the world. I warmly welcome all of you for this live webinar organized by CA Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter. I am Mangala Rajapaksha, the president of CA Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter. It's my pleasure to inform you that there are participants from more than 14 countries join at the moment. And I hope all of you will find this session very interesting and useful. This is our third live webinar in the series of live webinars organized by the executive committee of the chapter. As you are aware, today's webinar is on strategic revival plan for Sri Lanka's economy in post COVID-19 era. COVID-19 has battered the world with its viral and deadly impact with millions of people being affected and hundreds of thousands dying. At the same time, the virus and its aftermath has wrecked the economies of almost all the countries. Therefore, as Sri Lankans, it is important to understand how Sri Lanka as a country faced these economic challenges and possible revival strategies. To discuss the same, we have invited a prominent resource person. Now, I would like to extend a special welcome to our resource person today, Mr. Ajit Nival Khabra. Mr. Ajit Nival Khabra is a chartered accountant by profession and he is a past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka and South Asian Federation of Accountants. He was an internationally recognized consultant in corporate governance and was the chairman of the Co Corporate Governance Committee, which developed the first code of best practice in corporate governance in Sri Lanka. He was the 12th governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka from 2006 to 2015. Prior to his appointment as a governor, Mr. Cabral was the chief advisor to the president of Sri Lanka on economic affairs and served as a secretary to the Ministry of Plan Implementation. He was closely associated in the development of policy framework and development plan for the government. Prior to his state appointments, Mr. Kapral functioned as a management consultant, specializing in his business revival and turnaround, planning and corporate governance. During this period, he served as a chairman as well as a director of many quoted and unquoted companies. He also served on the boards of the Securities and Exchange Commission, National Institute of Business Management, Postgraduate Institute of Management, and University of Moratua. He currently holds the position of Senior Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. Mr. Cabral, we are honored and warmly welcome you to the session as a resource person. And also this session will be moderated by Mr. Siras Matin, a fellow chartered accountant and one of the senior and founder member of CA Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter. And at present, he holds the position of Chief Financial Officer at Almelam Group Kuwait. With that, I will now hand over the control to Mr. Shiraz Matin to take the session forward. Shiraz, over to you. Thank you, Mangala. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have allocated approximately a total of one hour for this session, with about half an hour for questions included. So this is basically the format. Coronavirus has created havoc on a global scale and uh, continues counting the thousands of new cases and deaths recorded daily. The unfathomable effects of this disaster has been widely spoken of, and yet it feels like we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. There is no doubt that the scale of this problem will affect all of us as individuals, as families, a nation, and a species and are sure to feel its devastation over the months or maybe even years to come. To give us a national perspective as to how to tackle this problem and address your questions and concerns, we have with us today one of the longest standing governors in the 66 year history of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He was a foremost advocate of Sri Lanka in the international finance arena, attracting much foreign investment to post-war Sri Lanka secured over $2.6 billion from the IMF to deal with the global financial crisis in 2008, executed the first sovereign bond issue of Sri Lanka in the international capital markets, reduced inflation rates from around record 28% to 0.7%, reduced interest rates from 20% to single digit, increased foreign reserves to a record $7 billion, these are a few from a long list of spectacular achievements during a very successful tenor 
as the governor of Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the former governor, Mr. Ajit Nivad Kabral, to take us through insights to the strategic revival plan for Sri Lanka's economy in post-COVID-19 era. Mr. Cabral, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Mangala and to all of you. I'm indeed delighted to be present here with all of you because it's my own profession as well. So sometimes linking up with uh, Chartered Accountant Shiraz is always a great pleasure. And uh, I value that interaction a great deal. As you know, uh, it has been the cornerstone of my life. And what I have been uh, taught as well as practiced in my accountancy profession has really been holding me in good stead in my life after. And I must say that I am I owe a deep debt of gratitude to the profession. And I'm indeed happy to be associated with all of you today to share a few thoughts as to what Sri Lanka could do in order to move forward with confidence as well as with a lot more with a lot more uh, energy when we face up to this massive challenge as both of you have already enumerated. I won't want to go into the nitty gritties of the COVID itself, but I will say that it is time for us to take proper stock of the situation and then also reflect on what we did so far and develop a set of core strategies as to what we should be doing in order to take us forward. Now, in doing so, we are in uncharted territory. We got to be ready to accept that. Not every decision that we take will be the exactly the right one. There can be some which we may have to start off with, but then we might even go back on it saying, look, it didn't work very well, let's do something else. Because no one knows the exact right answers. We know the concepts. We know what would generally work in a situation of this nature. We know what the difficulty is. We know what the problem is. That is, we have a huge reduction in global demand. We have a huge reduction in national demand. Now, when you have a situation of that nature, you've got to understand that you've got to stimulate growth. Because unless you stimulate the economies, stimulate the growth, you would probably find that we are unable to get our economies moving. The very reason why oil prices have come down so drastically is because nobody's buying oil. Oil is there. It's not that the supply had any problem. But when people do not buy enough oil, then the price drops and it continues to drop. So much so that one day we saw how oil had to be uh, not sold, but people had to pay money in order to get the oil to move out from their own goal. in the light of the information that we have and then go forward. Now, the way I thought we should, um, we should um, reflect on this matter is to, first of all, take a bit of a time out. As you know, when you have a uh, match and then you have some element of absolute uncertainty or doubt, you take a little time out and then say, okay, well, let's see how best we are going to deal with this situation. Now, in this situation also, we got, to, we got to take a little bit of a time out. And already we have taken that time out. Now people know it is now since um, around um, end February that we really got to grips with this situation. Now we are in June. So we know what the COVID has done from a health point of view, as well as from an economic point of view. So then we realized the impact of this situation is going to be felt in different ways. Now, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, what we have seen is that it had had a huge impact on our tourism. It had had a huge impact on our exports, particularly the garment exports, because most of the garment buying countries have been gripped by this COVID and they have had a massive downturn in their own sales, which has been reflected as downturn of their orders. And that, in turn, 
has led to a lot of orders being cancelled. So now we have to deal with that situation. So we have large amount of capacity in the sense we have factories as well as hotels which are now idle. We have people who have been trained and who have been working and who have been generate who have been getting salaries as well as incomes from those institutions. Those are idle. Sometimes people do not realize that we have 90,000 BNB outfits in Sri Lanka, 90,000 bed and breakfast uh, rooms, which are on Airbnb. So when there are no business for those, those people also are naturally are in difficulty. So like that, there's a large number of people who are associated with the tourism trade, associated with the, with the uh, garment trade, who are going to be very badly affected. Sri Lanka has about 15 lakhs of people who are working in the government sector. We have another 26 lakhs who are in the formal business sector who, who get uh, EPF benefits and so on. Then we have another 27 lakhs of people who are working in the informal sector, like air conditioning mechanics, uh, like plumbing people, like um, those who are having vegetable, who are, who are having uh, small boutiques so there's another 27 lakhs of people who are working then we have another 19 lakhs of people who are daily people have some element of difficulty over the last two to three months which means that they have to be supported in some way so where is their income going to come from the government to support them so this is another major challenge that we have to be facing with so in that context i suggested that we have to deal with it with a few key strategies and i'll take you through those quite rapidly number one i think we need to have a time out with regard to our loans that are being paid not commercial loans but the loans that we have to repay to the imf as well as to the world bank now these two institutions were set up way back in just after the second world war and their mandate was to bring stability to the global economies as well as to bring development activities to the global economy. Now, in that sense, I think it's very much within their mandate to provide some element of support to countries after being in existence for nearly 70 years. So what should they do? I think they should, at least for a period of two years, provide a timeout, provide a debt standstill to the countries which are seeking such a debt standstill. I think already uh, some of the US uh, senators as well as US lawmakers have ex uh, said the same thing. Uh, the IMF managing director has said very clearly that they think extraordinary problems need extraordinary uh, resolutions and techniques to deal with it. So I think in that light, they should take this unprecedented step note out, but to give a period of two years of a moratorium, which means that all the countries who have difficulties will be then able to deal with the situation with, with a great amount of confidence. Now, in a situation of this nature, if all the countries get this relief, all the countries become well again. It's like when you have a, uh, when you have a huge uh, epidemic, you have to inoculate all, you have to give, a, you have to give the, uh, the uh, vaccine to everyone. Because otherwise, you're always suspicious as to whether this next guy is going to have this disease or not. In the same way, when you have a large number of countries which are going to be faced with this problem, you've got to ensure that all those countries are given, the countries that have the problem are given relief. And then when you do that, you find that all the countries are safeguarded. Because those who have lent money also otherwise will be at all times wondering whether these countries will have difficulty. And if they do, the countries which have lent money also are going to be in difficulty. So it's a kind of a win-win situation to all. Uh, it's a kind of a time that um, needs extraordinary relief measures. And I think a uh, situation of that nature and the relief of that nature would be very much in the cards for, for all the countries. And that would mean that the health of all the countries will be assured. And I hope that the G7 countries will uh, respond to this positively and then we can take it forward.
that's a that's a macro level type of activity which we need to support we must also go and uh, be a part of that uh, discussion sri lanka must support that and if we do that we'll probably find that many countries will also uh, do that with a lot more enthusiasm and then the chances of us being able to secure that as emerging nations would be very great and that would be vital for sri lanka the second we have seen lots of the businesses having difficulty even before that there were many many businesses in sri lanka which were having difficulties because of the general downturn in our economy and after that we had the easter sunday attacks which also uh, put a damper on businesses and then with the covid many businesses have been having serious challenges that they had to face now we need to bring some new capital into those uh, uh, companies in order to make them revive make them to be revived so what i would suggest is that with the money that we would save particularly in rupee form because we don't have if we don't have to make the payments to the imf and the world bank to allocate at least half of that saving towards the business revival of our companies and the other half to be used as a safety net for the people who are going to be seriously affected already the government had done something good to been providing some relief but that is not enough because if we were to provide something substantial that also would stimulate demand and i would very much like to see that happening with the money that we would save in not having to pay for two years the amounts that we would have had to pay to the imf and world bank the third strategy that i would recommend is to set up a global uh, equity capital fund now we know that all these struggling companies will be searching for new cash inflows to come into their businesses otherwise they would find it very difficult to maintain their stability as well as their liquidity now if we were to burden them with further debt what i see is they would have the old debt to pay they would have to pay the old interest they would have to pay the new interest and the new debt and that's going to be all done with the incomes that they would be having out of the uh, business and i don't see that rising too too much in the in the near term which means that those businesses will struggle further now if we don't want that to happen we'll have to make sure that there is some infusion of capital but that capital need to be in equity form now the us if you remember uh, immediately after the uh, time that they had the global financial shock they brought in what is known as a tarp the troubled assets uh, revival plan and with that what they did was they provided equity capital sometimes even the fed reserve gave money to the banks as equity and then of course they after that they sold those shares and made a lot of money but that's a different issue but yet at the time that it was given it was in the form of equity so that they did not have to service yet another loan with their incomes that were being generated as a result of a downturn so if you are to really safeguard these companies i think we need to have a global equity fund set up in sri lanka and that can be done with a uh, infusion of about a billion dollars we have already tapped the markets in sri lanka by way of having um, uh, debt capital sovereign bond i think uh, uh, anjula mentioned about uh, the debt capital that we raised during the time that i was governor as well but now we got to have a different type of capital the equity capital coming into our companies and that's something that we'll have to raise and the government will have to give that support to raise a big fund out of which fund then allocations can be made to several companies for a certain portion of their equity and if that is provided the companies will be turned back into good health and that's vital as far as the uh, uh, corporate sector of the country is concerned the fourth is that we see something that has been a necessity in sri lanka for a long time maybe a good time for us to bring this also in that is to bring in venture capital a lot of people have fantastic ideas they come and say i have this great idea but no one is there to support and they ask the government to support and it's very unlikely that the government would be in a position to support a new idea considering the risk that these new ideas will always have so i think it needs to be from a private sector driven initiative 
but with the support of the government. So I would like to see after the elections, the government supporting a private sector effort to generate a large pool of capital to come into Sri Lanka by way of venture capital funds. And I think we can source that kind of funds in the next few months and years. And if we do that, we'll have a ready source of new money coming into Sri Lankan businesses, good ideas, which can then be turned into profitable ventures. And that's essential because if we do that only, that we'll see the entire business sector being revitalized. And that's something that I would like to promote uh, as soon as possible so that Sri Lanka will have a new base of capital also coming in. And that will be very helpful as far as the entire economy is concerned. The fourth is that we got to re-attract back to Sri Lanka investments into the government treasury bills and treasury bonds. At the time that I left the central bank, we had something like $3,450 million of investments in Sri Lankan bonds and bills. Now that was a very useful amount of foreign capital that was in rupee, rupee instruments, which helped us to maintain our rupee at a reasonable level, make, make it stable, and that was vital for businesses to move forward. But unfortunately, that has dwindled now. We only have about $125 million worth of investments in Sri Lankan treasury bills and treasury bonds. But that shows us that there is capacity for us to bring it back. So we've got to work hard at it. And I would like to see that effort being taken. And um, I would like to support that effort very much because we would like to see funds coming back into Sri Lanka, into Sri Lankan rupee securities. I remember even coming into Kuwait at one time and uh, talking to banks as well as to the central bank there and to many of the Middle Eastern banks, Middle Eastern um, uh, central banks. And we got a large support from those areas. So now we got to take it back. We got to once again woo investors from the US, from Europe, from Asia, from the Middle East to come back into these rupee securities. And I think there is great scope to do that. And we need to do that with a lot of effort in the next few months. The next one is uh, with regard to tourism. Tourism is a very important product in our Sri Lankan entire economic sphere. And to support that, we got to now search for new ways in which we can market Sri Lanka to have more people coming into Sri Lanka. And I think because of our stringent regulations, we cannot have short term tourists. We have tourists who normally come into Sri Lanka and their normal average stay is about 10 days. Now, if we were to have um, these uh, quarantine arrangements, then we got to search for tourists who will come for a longer period. So the next winter, I believe, would be a good time for us to promote Sri Lanka within Europe, within China, within US to say, come to Sri Lanka, you can have a wonderful time without COVID. Because even if you do get COVID, the chances of recovery are very, very strong. As you know, out of about 1,800 uh, people who came into Sri Lanka who had uh, contracted the COVID, uh, only about 11 people died. We are sad about those 11. But at the same time, uh, many of them were people who came from outside and the, and the verge of uh, a very strong illness. That's why they succumbed to it. But many people have been cured. And many people could be cured because perhaps of our climate. So we got to make that as a unique selling point and promote tourism once again. Already I can see a large number of initiatives being taken by the tourism sector to do that. And uh, if we do that well, I think we can attract tourists to come in for a longer period of time. Maybe for uh, two, one month or two months or even three months. Now, if we do that, we'll probably find that with a lesser number of tourists, we can provide, we can perhaps uh, get the same amount of uh, income as far as the country is concerned. The seventh uh, strategy that I would like to promote is to have import substitution being uh, being supported with a strong flavor and strong effort. Already we did have many times where we spoke about in, in import substitution, yes. But this time round, we got to do it in a scientific manner. There may be many products, services, 
as well as um, items that we could produce in Sri Lanka or grow in Sri Lanka or have as a service in Sri Lanka. Now we got to search for those and attack those and to make sure that we do those in Sri Lanka. In my view, it can be at least $5 billion worth of um, sales that we can re-energize back into Sri Lanka. So out of our total imports of about 19 to $20 billion, I would think that we can at least reduce it by about $5 billion and provide those services or manufacture those items here in Sri Lanka itself. This will also mean that there is going to be a large investment to be done here. It would mean that we got to invite new people, new entrepreneurs to come in and work here in Sri Lanka. It would mean that Sri Lankan entrepreneurs will now have a greater necessity to provide those services within Sri Lanka, which is all economic activity. So that means our growth will rise and then we'll be on a much better wicket as we go along. The last strategy. Now, these are all strategies which are more over and above what we should be doing in, in normal circumstances. Being now should continue without any, any reduction. But these are new items that I think we need to do in order to take us forward in the next few months and years, particularly as in meeting with the challenge of COVID. Now, in that sense, I also think that many Sri Lankans have been battered. I think uh, Anjul mentioned that at the beginning itself, how many people have been battered. And uh, in order to bring some relief to them, I think we got to consider providing a return of their own EPF to them up to about a maximum of 20%. Now, after I had articulated this suggestion, it has already been done in Australia as well as in uh, India. But I think uh, we might need to consider doing that here as well, because a lot of people are today in debt, they are struggling, they cannot do make ends meet. And that can be a very huge dampener, it's a big dampener on their social life, of their outlook in life, and so on. So in order to provide them with some relief and reduce the stress of the people, I think uh, a 20% re uh, return without any questions, without conditions would be a good thing. And it's money that is re being returned to them itself. And if someday we feel that um, uh, their savings have been reduced as a result, and then that's going to be a problem, we can perhaps even consider in another few years time whether we could increase the retirement age. But there are different ways of handling this. So I think um, we got to do that now because a lot of people have got to their maximum limits as far as their credit card debt is concerned. And the, many people are unable to pay their debts and they are facing legal action. Their creditors are knocking on their door and that's not a good sign for a country to have. So I think that relief must come to the people. And at the same time, if that money is returned to the people, they would probably find a large amount of there'll be a large pool of capital that will be in, in the country and which will circulate within the economy as well. And that would stimulate the economy further. So that's another uh, very useful side effect, which I think is uh, not something that we should ignore as well. There would be a great amount of uh, economic activity that would be created. And I would like to see that happening as well. So overall, we already done a moratorium, which uh, has provided some relief to businesses. We have um, uh, reduced taxes, which in my view may be a little too much now, and we might have to push back a little bit. Uh, at the same time, even the uh, moratorium, the implementation of that has been somewhat uh, weak. We'll have to deal with that as well. Whilst we would improve those, I think overall, Sri Lanka would do well if we are to make sure that those initiatives are also better implemented because that would mean that Sri Lanka would be able to meet with this challenge in a much more cohesive manner. So we have our work cut out for us. It's not going to be easy. But in order to do all this, my final point that I want to stress is that we need to have a government that understands these issues as well as the problems. And we also need to have a government in place. Because even if you are to go and discuss some matter with the IMF or with the World Bank or with anyone, we've got to go with some authority. To go with authority, we must have a proper parliament in place. 
we must be able to go and hold out to anyone outside saying we can pass the laws that are necessary for us to take us our matters forward. So in order to do that, the election was vital. We had the parliament dissolved on the 2nd of March uh, this year. And fortunately, after a long layoff, COVID, as well as various other issues, we are finally now looking at August 5th as being the date for the election. And I'm hoping that that would go without any hitch because it's vital that Sri Lanka has a proper, stable government in place in order to de deal with this huge challenge. This is a challenge of unprecedented proportions. And you cannot deal with a challenge of this nature unless you have the ability to face up to it with confidence and with clarity. Now that will come only with a proper government in place, with the proper authority in place, and a proper legitimacy of the government in place. So we are hoping that that also would uh, take place in the next few months. But this is our preparatory time. Although it, sometimes I call this time a nonagate period where much cannot be achieved because of the fact that we got to uh, remain uh, within certain boundaries and we remain without too much executive power. But I think in time to come, once those are in place, we got to have some rapid action taking place, rapid action. So to do that, let's uh, prepare ourselves. Let's be clear in our minds as to what we should do. These are thoughts at the moment, but these will have to be fleshed out, given, given additional uh, support as well as given additional uh, uh, flesh with the inputs coming from persons such as yourselves. And I'm particularly glad that I was able to have this conversation with you because we look forward to your support, to your ideas, to your, in, uh, to your inputs as well. Because together, we'll have to deal with the situation. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well as looking forward to your continued support in this venture, which will take our beloved country forward with the support of all of us put together. Thank you very much to the Chartered Accountants of Kuwait to the um, president as well as all of you for giving me this opportunity to share these thoughts. And I'm now ready for any questions that you would like to take from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. Thank you very much for that uh, eight point uh, plan, great eight point plan uh, that you have uh, articulated and then uh, kind of given us the insights as to how it's, uh, it's gonna work and how it's gonna help us. So. Um, to start, I just want to have uh, ask you uh, one question. Uh, as far as the acceptance of this plan and the uh, execution of this plan, where does it stand uh, uh, in your discussions uh, with the top uh, uh, in the leadership of the country? You see, right now, <coughs> right now, <coughs> Shiraz, we are gathering plans. Gather Gathering thoughts, gathering ideas. I don't, I'm not the repository of the great ideas of this country. And I know there are many, many others who would have some great ideas. And we would like to see all those being considered. And my view is, once we have that, I only did this to stimulate the uh, action. And if we have that coming through, we'll have plenty of ideas that we can have on the shelf and then we can look at that. Once we have a government in place, there will be ministries that will have to look at it. There will be a cabinet that will have to look at it. And at that stage, we'll take some firm decisions. But to take the firm decisions, I want to see as many items on the shelf as possible. Because then only we can decide which ones would be the best for us to implement. So this is, these are essentially ideas right now. Of course, I have discussed it with many people. but. Um, I would like to see many more ideas coming in from many more people with different experiences. And once we have that, and once we have a government in place, uh, we would like to uh, go forward uh, on day one. And that's why this time I'm using as a preparatory period. And that's why I'm uh, particularly glad that people like you have taken the time to uh, listen as well as perhaps coin some new thoughts and come back to us. 
Fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I would uh, like to uh, ask the audience uh, or, the, or the listeners to post their questions uh, to Mr. Cabral to take uh, good, um, uh, take, take advantage of this opportunity because uh, you're uh, talking to one of the greatest minds uh, who had uh, seen the economics and the finances of the country. So please uh, post your questions. Uh, and uh, I can take it up. I can't see any questions coming on the chat box. Uh, so, can I use the Q and A section? Q and A section. Okay, right. Okay, uh, now I can see the questions. Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Cabral, Dasun Jayavadana has posted one question. What's your advice to overseas? CAs, I assume that it is chartered accountants. Do you promote them to settle back in Sri Lanka? Talking in, taking into consideration, some have lost their jobs overseas as well. Anyone who has uh, lost a job will be most welcome back to our country because your country is, is your country too. And we, we know what contribution you can make in Sri Lanka and we would like to see you back. Uh, and there would be opportunities, I know. But even in Sri Lanka, there would be less number of opportunities in, in the short term. But until we get all these situations up and running. So I think it would be challenging even for the Sri Lankan chartered accountants. But I think the way Sri Lanka would tackle this situation, we haven't lost as many jobs as some of the other countries have so far. I'm still talking um, before we have got all the data in, in place. But yet, I would like to see those who are stable opportunities in those countries, staying there for the time being, and then coming back at some stage or the other, when Sri Lanka is having greater number of opportunities. But if you have lost a job, then Sri Lanka will invite you back, and we would like to see you coming back with your capital as well, and there'll be always something to do here. So um, let me say, put it this way, you are always back, uh, you are always welcome back in your homeland, in your country. But at the same time, in this particular moment of time, if you do have a secure opportunity in your country of uh, choice for the time being, please make use of that because it would be helpful because we wouldn't have uh, that number of opportunities opening out in Sri Lanka in the short term. And that would essentially mean that there would be a time lag uh, for any opportunities to develop here in Sri Lanka as well. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Prasanna Ratnayak says, initially the new government had plans to uh, uh, forecasted an economic growth of 5% in 2021. But uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak, when do you think that this 5% rate could be achieved? Excellent question. My own view is we would have a very, very challenging year this year. Now, one good thing about uh, challenging years is that if you do have your uh, GDP going down, the next year when there is a pickup and you pick it up even above what you had, you will probably have a very low base on which you are working. So if we were to have uh, some uh, improvement in our uh, rupee, as well as stronger growth in 2021. 2021 could be a reasonably good year, but we shouldn't fool ourselves thinking that it's really a great year because we would be working from a low base of 2020. 2020 is going to be a difficult one. Already six months almost has gone by. And in the six months, I think the downturn has been quite severe. We got to understand it that in, in that context. So. A bad year, 2020, would mean that the 2021 year would be better. But at the same time, even though 2021 is better and you have a number which shows as some, something positive, uh, I don't think we should get too enamored by that, but we got to work much harder. I'm looking at uh, promoting a lot more investments to come in to Sri Lanka and to make sure that we have uh, a steady supply of investment in 2021 as well. That's going to be challenging. That's going to be difficult because there would be the global downturn as well. 
But unless we try very hard, and Sri Lanka doesn't need a large pool of capital to come in in order to promote uh, the new stimulus. That's why I mentioned that we have some element of debt standstill, some element of uh, infusion of uh, capital coming into the equity markets, some element of capital coming into the venture capital markets. That would be, I think, sufficient for us to stimulate that growth. And there are many companies within Sri Lanka also who are once again looking at um, growth opportunities, which would be slow, but could happen by the end of this year. And if that happens, uh, I wouldn't like to put it as high as 5% for 2021, but I think we could look at a reasonable positive growth in 2021. Let's keep our fingers crossed, and but work hard towards that. Keeping 5% as a goal would be something really good, and I would like to support that from that point of view, because we so that although keeping in mind that we shouldn't get too discouraged if we don't achieve that. But let's work for that. Uh, Frank Dias has a question. I will uh, read it out exactly the way he says it. One of the main reasons why Sri Lanka is still developing, is, is a developing nation, is our pathetic transportation system. Could you please explain in detail as to how the government is getting to improve it or going to improve it? Excellent question. I think uh, there is not a validity in that question too. Uh, if you remember from the period 2006 to 2014 when we were in office, one of the key areas that we uh, attacked was the road system. We did have about 123 kilometers of uh, highways brought into Sri Lanka for the first time in our history. Then we did something like 30,000 village level roads in concrete. That is a huge change. Many people wouldn't have seen it from a point of view of the urban life, but it made a massive transformation in the village lives of our people. With, out of the about 60,000 kilometers of uh, road network that we have, uh, we developed about 30,000 kilometers of village road. Then most of the provincial roads were also done up. A lot of the provincial roads were done up. But with that happened, what when that happened, a large number of vehicles were also imported into the country, which meant that our uh, total outlook of transportation changed. Then the next stage of development was that we were going to have uh, in the year 2015 to 2017, we were going to develop the monorail, linking up the city uh, from about uh, Kalania right up to about Morotua, and then going up to Kalkolo now the other side. Uh, about 123 kilometers once again of elevated rail network. It could have been monorail or some other type, but that still has not got done. And that's essential for it to be done, I think, in my view. Because if we do that, the congestion within the city would be, uh, would be, would be uh, a thing of the past. Well, again, population growth as well as people's affluence coming up will definitely mean that uh, uh, that would take place again. But at least in the short term, we would have dealt with it. So a lot to be done. Uh, we got to improve our road network further. If you come into Sri Lanka now, you would see there is a large number of uh, programs that are taking place. Uh, we are also trying to improve uh, at least um, 100,000 kilometers of road network, which is going to be of a good level and a good uh, situation. That is the village roads as well as the provincial roads as well as the district roads. That's going to be a huge task. But with that will come the congestion. And that also has to be dealt with with proper public transport. Now, public transport is something that uh, has been neglected to a great extent. I must admit, uh, as Frank uh, mentioned, uh, we haven't got that right so far. We have experimented in different ways. We have seen the state doing it. Then we got the private sector involved. Uh, we still haven't got that exact right measurement, uh, right uh, formula in uh, Shiraz, but let's see, the next few years, we got some plans to develop the road network, the connectivity between the trains as well as the, the buses. So all those together would probably improve the network and that's something that we'll be working hard towards uh, moving. I, I have to tell you, Mr. Kapal, not only the professionals of Sri Lanka, 
as Sri Lankan professionals, but Sri Lankans as, as a whole have a lot of expectations from this new leadership uh, going forward. So we are hopeful that many of these changes are going to take place and then we can kind of come out of this uh, better than we were before. So moving on to the next I question. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Samantha is uh, asking, uh, with the uh, suggestion of starting new ventures and initiatives, uh, what kind of steps is the government taking to support made in Sri Lanka culture? Again, another excellent question. Uh, made in Sri Lanka is going to be the theme uh, for the moves forward. In fact, it's very interesting that he just asked that question. Just uh, two days ago, uh, I visited um, uh, a, a large uh, estate in uh, Kaluthara, in um, Kaluthara district, to see whether we can allocate a large tract of land for exactly that, made in Sri Lanka, that is import substitution. Because we have been thinking about export, which is excellent, but import substitution is also a kind of a uh, reverse export. So we got to promote that as well. So there are a lot of businesses. In fact, about 117 uh, businesses and entrepreneurs were keen to come forward and they had given their names. And that's why uh, we went there to look at this land in Matugama see whether we can have this uh, allocated and that will be something that we we'll like to fast track because uh, made in sri lanka is definitely something that we need to promote uh, and that uh, is something that this government especially would be uh, happy to promote as you know the philosophy of the um, uh, this government and its party has been that too uh, for example like um, the, the concept of concept of uh, food uh, the ahara surakshit bhave that is uh, making sure that we have enough uh, food in our country sustainability. Mm. food sustainability so okay. those are all concepts that we would like to be uh, promoting once again and supporting strongly and made in sri lanka will be a key ingredient out of that and we would be supporting that fully there would be tax incentives most probably for that. Uh, there would be um, support from in the case of doing business indicators, one-stop shops that will help people to set up those businesses, uh, fast tracking of approvals, fast tracking of um, the support services like electricity, like water, like road network and so on. So those are all being looked at right now. And doing business is one area that we'll definitely have to improve quite a bit. And that's an area that we will set up a special task force in order to improve the, uh, uh, the government services as well and to take that part forward in a very, very uh, fast tracked manner. Thank you, Mr. Kapra. Uh, Faraz Farooq, uh, would the government of Sri Lanka have to step in uh, with some sort of stimulus package? like some of the other jurisdictions are doing, what could be such stimulus? Now, what I did mention in my introduction were actually the stimulus uh, that uh, Farooq is speaking about. Now, I also think that as a general rule of thumb, what many countries have used so far, Shiraz, has been at least having 10% of GDP as being the norm of the value of the stimulus. So all the stimuli put together must at least be 10% in order to, for it to have some impact. Now that's why I think our economy, which is about 15 trillion rupees, we should have a combination of stimuli, which will add up to at least 1.5 trillion, that is 1,500 billion rupees worth of stimuli is necessary for us to break the shackles and uh, project ourselves. Because 50 billion, 100 billion will be useful, no doubt, but would be the sufficient stimuli in order to take us forward. So these ideas that I mentioned to you add up to around the 10% of GDP mark. 
and that's why it's necessary that we have a combination of these so that there will be a overall impact on our entire economy because otherwise we would see stimulus but it's not going to be of any great impact on our economy so that's the key and to have that impact we got to have some value in it and uh, as uh, you just mentioned that's something that is at our minds in our minds because without that we'll probably not be able to make that impact to take the economy into a different level once again um, let me try and get this question from Ashoka. Recent three-wheeler killings shows that still financial inclusion is a challenge. It's a question, actually. Probably you. Yes, it is because a lot of times we do find that um, there are people who access finance in different ways. There are the people who go to the banks, then there are people who go to the formal finance companies. Then there are others who go into the more informal type of microfinance institutions. Then there are others who can have arrangements in a completely informal manner. Now, all those are parts of a spectrum of financing. Now, I think each one of those parts is, is important. If you were to completely destroy one of those parts saying that there are some issues in that, it would mean that some people may not have access to finance at all. Now, I know there are some people who are purchasing vegetables and selling in the market who have, who have no security to give, who have no track record to offer, who have no access to a bank, who have no access to a microfinance institution, but they probably go, at, go to a loan shark and borrow uh, 900 rupees and they repay 1000 rupees at the end of the day. I'm not promoting that. I'm not a great fan of that. But to a man who has no access to finance at all, that is the way that he would have finance, which will allow him to make money. So if he were to borrow the 900 rupees and then he sells something and he makes 2000 rupees out of that and he pays the 1000 rupees back and he still made 1000 bucks. So now each one of those types of activities has a certain place in an economy. It's good, easy for us to say, look, uh, these guys are bad and they shouldn't do that. And then what happens to those who actually access that finance? So it's a problem that you need to look at in a more holistic manner. And I have done that on many occasions. And I have tried to lure people who are in the extreme segments of this um, spectrum to come into the more formal sectors. And that's always a challenge. So we got to make that happen and we have attracted a lot of those people who were in those uh, dubious forms of financing to come into the more formal sectors uh, but it will take some more time uh, that we did see this situation which is extremely unfortunate which should not, should not have happened at all but um, those need to be dealt with from a criminal point of view on one side but the actual inherent difficulty and problem that we are facing has to be also tackled in a different light and that's something that we'll definitely need to be working on in the future as well. Thank you, Asoka. Um, Mr. Gabriel, Sanjeev Karunathalaka says, uh, what elements of the government's master plan prior to the COVID-19 crisis would you see being deprioritized to make the fiscal space to tackle the challenges in the immediate aftermath of COVID-19? Yeah. That's a loaded question. It's a tough question to answer as well, uh, because as you know, uh, we have had some reduction in our overall revenues as well. So picking what are the items that will probably lead to uh, lesser support is always going to be more difficult. But I would approach it differently. I would think that we got to search for ways and means in which we can raise more finances. As you know, we did that quite successfully way back in the years 2006 to 2014. Every time when we needed finances, we found new ways of generating. Sometimes people do not realize that when you have a debt of about, say, 4 trillion, if you have 1% reduction in your interest rate, you save 40 billion rupees. And that's a lot of money. 40 billion will probably buy you the Colombo Katanaik Expressway. So there are different ways of uh, approaching this. So I would think 
when you have a complex problem of this nature, one way of dealing with it is certainly deprioritizing some of those uh, expenditure and then dealing with it. But the more adventurous manner and more uh, nationalistic manner would be to not cut off those as well and to do and search for new avenues in which we could promote all those activities together. Maybe we might stimulate the private sector to do that. If we get new ventures for the private sector to come in and then uh, we attract them, uh, that may be a way to go. So I think uh, the new government, once it is elected, would look at this whole picture once again and see what options do we have. Do we cut anything or do we grow something? So that's, that will be the challenge before us. Uh, I would personally prefer to grow new avenues in which we could do business, avenues of financing rather than cut. But cutting is also an option that we sometimes might be compelled to look at. And if you have to do that, we'll have to cut it in the areas that uh, will uh, pose the minimum element of risk to the economic growth as well. Because as you know, uh, it's a delicate balance managing an economy. I have seen that uh, uh, from inside because each activity has its values. So if you are going to uh, not do something, you've got to be considering that as essentially a short-term decision and hope that you can get back to that as quickly as possible. So that's the challenge. That's the balance. Uh, let's hope uh, we won't have too many areas that we'll have to cut and that we'll be able to balance that uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Very, very <laughs> complex, and but yet hopeful. Uh, Imtaz Ali says, Sri Lankan debt percentage as, uh, uh, debt as a percentage of GDP has surpassed its peers. How can this be overcome, especially with COVID situation? See, the most important part of debt, uh, Shiraz, is that we got to approach it from several angles. Debt should not only be looked at from the point of view of its bulk. Now, if you take Japan, Japan has a debt which is 250% of its GDP. But it's not a burden because their interest rate is quarter percent. So the debt is not putting a huge burden on their budget. Now that's one way of looking at it. So if we are to control our debt and, take, uh, and make, uh, make it um, work for us, we got to certainly look at ways and means in which the debt to GDP is reduced. That means one side is we got to increase our GDP. If we were to improve our GDP, then our indebtedness reduces quite substantially. That's one way of tackling the debt. The other is to ensure that it doesn't balloon out of proportion. If you were to keep a careful tap on the rupee, and the rupee is not allowed to depreciate unnecessarily, then you would probably find that your debt doesn't balloon itself. Now, last year, our debt increased by a trillion rupees, by a trillion rupees, just because the rupee depreciated. So you can just imagine what kind of an impact it has. Now, during the time that I was governor in the last two years of my term, the, the rupee appreciated, and our debt actually decreased in rupee terms by about 100 billion rupees. Now, 100 billion rupees at that time would have bought us the Orochole power plant. So you can just imagine what elements of debt management uh, you got to be conscious of if we are to manage it in a proper way. I can talk about this technical matter because all you guys are chartered accountants and you will understand it. But this is not something of a conversation that I would have normally because many people wouldn't uh, see the benefit of this uh, type of intervention because you understand it. All of you, I'm sure, would understand it, but not very many people will appreciate it or understand. The third part is how further on is your debt repayment, your average time to maturity. Now, I used to keep a very close tab on the average time to maturity and try and extend that as much as possible so that your risk of renewal of the debt of rolling over the debt is always reduced. So if you take a careful look at all these three aspects, you would find that we would be able to improve it. Now, if you look at the term that I was governor, 
our debt to GDP decreased from 91% to 71%. So that means our ability to repay our debt was enhanced. Number two, our interest rates, as you mentioned it at the beginning itself, we brought down substantially. So that means the risk to the government and the, and the hit to the budget was getting less and lesser and lesser. So that's another aspect. The third was the longevity of our debt. If you were to be able to increase that, then you would find that we are able to manage the debt in a much easier manner. So these three simple concepts help me to refashion the debt strategy of Sri Lanka. Now, I think we have a challenge once again. We are starting off uh, this year with a debt percentage which is close to 90%. We are having interest rates which are too high. We are having a rupee that is quite unstable. We, are, we, are, we, are, we have our work cut out. So this is a careful uh, methodology that we have to implement. So that we do it in a, not look at one item only. We got to have all these matters to be dealt with together. It's a simultaneous equation. It's pretty much like a doctor who has a patient which is, uh, who is having some serious difficulties from all sides. So you don't even, you don't treat only one. You got to treat all the different ailments together. So we'll have a tough time in managing the debt, but I'm optimistic that we'll be able to nurse it back into health. And once we do that, uh, I think we'll be uh, on a much better weekend. Some, some financial and economic, uh, engineering and masterminding is required, I guess. Definitely. And I, I'd like to see some of you guys helping us in that. Uh, because actually, uh, at the Central Bank, we had several uh, chartered accountants who were very, very uh, helpful. Uh, once the concept was coined and we did take an approach that we should deal with it in some uh, cohesive manner, they all rallied uh, together. And I was able to uh, put a strategy together. And I think uh, I'm proud to say that the chartered accountants were extremely helpful in fashioning that policy which made our debt strategy uh, perform. And that's something that uh, I can uh, pay tribute to the uh, chartered accountants uh, at this stage. It's encouraging and uh, we are quite proud to hear that, uh, Mr. Gabral. And you can be assured that uh, all chartered accountants, wherever we are, we are always willing to come forward and support these um, uh, movements. So Thank you. Uh, the situation is like we have reached uh, our time, but I'll take uh, maybe one or two questions more. There are several questions, but I have to apologize uh, to the audience that I will not be able to take all these questions. So if I take uh, Dinesh's question, he says, Mr. Cabral, what is your prediction on Columbus Stock Exchange before elections and after elections? Still, we see significant amount of foreign investments outflow uh, from the Columbus Stock Exchange in these days, uh, even though Sri Lanka has successfully controlled the COVID-19 situation. The Columbus Stock Exchange, like any other exchange, any other stock exchange, really rests on confidence. Otherwise, there is no way that you can explain as to how markets will shift so rapidly in these times. So we got to build confidence back. We got to make investors understand that we are not going to drop the ball. I think we did drop the ball here and there, and that was uh, not a good, good, not a, not a good thing. And I'm sad that it happened. So I think what we need to make sure is. We don't give any opportunity for investors, local as well as foreign, to think that Sri Lanka is going to drop the ball, that Sri Lanka is going to miss a trick. We've got to make sure that we have a good playing field, all the norms must be there, but at the same time, we must be fair to the investors. If you are fair to investors, we don't allow them to uh, lose monies unnecessarily, other than through their own uh, investment decisions, the market should be a platform on which they can make their decisions and then take their decisions the way they think is right for themselves. That may not be the right decision. That may not be the perfect decision. That may be on hindsight, the best decision that they could have taken, but that's all for the investor. Our business is to make sure that the platform is there, that the laws are effective, that we implement them well. And I would like to see that happening once the new government is in place. 
did support that. I personally uh, want to push for that uh, type of uh, activity so that there is greater confidence brought back to the market. And uh, I'll certainly be uh, supportive of that uh, part. And hopefully, we'll have the confidence back. Thank you, Mr. Gabra. So I will take one last question yes. before I pass on the mic uh, to Demuthu. Uh, this is, uh, Sanjeeva says, this is actually not relevant to the topic. But even I have uh, heard this from few of my friends around uh, Sri Lankans who are wondering, though this is not much relevant, he says, uh, a lot of people in the Middle East want to come back home. Uh, need to, yeah, a lot of, uh, being someone who is close to the country's leadership, how would you comment on this? This, I am assuming that this is relevant to this period because everything is on lock, lockdown and people can't get back home. So, I think, uh, Shiraz, it may be a, a reaction to the current conditions because many people have seen opportunities all over the world. And in today's context, those opportunities can be made use of from, the, from wherever you are. Now, today I'm speaking to all of you and... Uh, quite effectively having this conversation with all of you uh, from my own uh, office at home. So it tells us that we can work out from our own place uh, and do work elsewhere. So what it does is these developments that have taken place have now given us this ability to do this. So we may see in time to come uh, the work from home concept being a lot more utilized for the future. But we would like to see you working wherever you are working from, working for Sri Lanka. That's what I would like to see. If you do that, then you get your money back here. I must say I'm impressed with the uh, people who are working out there in the Middle East because all of you, you brave the conditions and you go there. And many of you earn money and bring it back to Sri Lanka, which has helped us a great deal. Not so from in other countries. I'm not mentioning those. I'm not in any way upset with them. But at the same time, that's a fact of life because some of them make it their home. And then when you make some other country your home, naturally your savings are there, your investments are there, and you are uh, there. But if you are in a place like where you are, like in Kuwait, which is essentially a stopgap or essentially a, a transition type of a position or a period, then it's likely that he would come back to Sri Lanka. He would like you to come back with your investment as well as your experience as well as your qualification because there will be opportunities for Sri Lanka. Presently, Sri Lanka's economy is about 83 to 84 billion dollars. The original plan in 2014 was that by 2020, we would have an economy which was going to be about 145 billion dollars. 145 billion dollars, which meant that our per capita income would have been around seven thousand dollars. Now, just imagine, seven thousand dollar per capita income country would have had a huge demand, which is which would have been double that of what was there in 2014. But unfortunately, that are not double. It has only grown by a very very small margin, which meant that the capacity of our economy to absorb new people coming in with high salaries would not have been as much as what it should have been. But if we have a good run, and we want to make that happen, I can tell you that. If we have a good run in the next two to three years, it would be of a type that would entice you to come back. Because I did remember in 2013, 2014, I had gone to several uh, seminars where people were talking about work in Sri Lanka. That was the theme. And then they were attracting young guys to come back to Sri Lanka. So that we have lost out a little bit. I do appreciate that and that is correct, but it can always be brought back. So let's see how that works. Uh, we would like to see that happening. So um, uh, we'll have to work a little harder. We'll have to work a little smarter. And then we'll have to make sure that we make use of all the new methods that we have in the world to take us forward. So uh, that's my uh, thought. Uh, I, I like that question. It's an excellent one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kabral, <laughs> for this uh, fantastic, very relevant, and uh, insightful session. 
and also having the patients to answer all kinds of questions coming from different angles. Uh, so uh, I, I really wish that we had some more time to kind of go through all other questions and maybe some more of your thoughts, but uh, there is a I time limit that, that too, But I, I do have another uh, engagement uh, where I have to go to horror tour for some other meetings. So oh, I'm sorry, right. I, I, so, I will have to rush off. Uh, yeah. Shiraz, but it was wonderful talking to you as well as your colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I appreciate the engaged uh, audience as well for all their uh, questions. And then I hope they had an uh, insightful time uh, like I did the, through, the, through the session. Uh, now I would like to hand over the mic to uh, the Vice President of the Kuwait chapter, uh, Mr. Dimutu Etugala, to uh, do the uh, uh, final vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Shiraz. And good evening to everyone. What an amazing presentation we have just received. And we cannot thank you enough, Mr. Ajit Nivad Cabral, former governor of Central Bank of Sri Lanka and the current senior advisor to Prime Minister on Economic Affairs. So more than anything, and you also have mentioned you are one of our senior child accountants and past presidents of Sri Lanka, for which we all are really proud of. Thank you so much again, sir, for your time. And we are truly honored to have you today in this event. You have already enriched every one of us and also the country officials with strategies to weather this pandemic situation. Thank you so much, sir. Shiraz Mateen. Thank you. Shiraz Mateen. Senior Child Accountant and CFO, Almelab Group Kuwait, for moderating this event and sharing your invaluable thoughts. Shiraz, thank you so much for your time as well. Thank you, David. On behalf of the President Mangal Rajapaksha and Executive Committee, I also should extend my gratitude to Asoka Rupa Singha, one of the prominent Senior Child Accountants in Kuwait and also a founding member of CS Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter for all the support extended throughout our session. And thank you so much, all the members, non-members and dignitaries from Sri Lanka, Kuwait, other GCC countries, and around the world. When we, when we checked the registration, there were around 150 participants registered from 14 countries, which is amazing. We truly believe that this webinar is really beneficial for every one of you. Thank you so much. And now it's time for me to give a quick update about our next CPD event, which will be on 27th Saturday this month on robotic process automation and big data analytics. This will be really relevant for today's time. So keep your date saved and we'll be in touch with you on the same. With that note, I would like to wrap up this session and my team, our team will be really happy if you can just click on the chat box and give your invaluable feedback on the link, which will really beneficial for us to improve our further events in the future. My dear friends, and our speaker also have mentioned, it might be stormy now, but rain doesn't last forever. Let's fight together, it's our country, because our country is our pride. Until we see you again, stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you everyone and thank you to Manjula as well as Asoka and Shiraz. I really appreciate it, Dibutu, and uh, wish you all the best and uh, I hope you all have a great time. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye -bye. so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.